Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Disrupt, the Museum of Political Corruption film screening and debate series. My name is Veronica Medina Metzner. I am a documentary filmmaker, a trustee with the Museum of Political Corruption, and it is my great pleasure and honor to host tonight's event. For those of you who don't know, the Museum of Political Corruption is a nonprofit, nonpartisan institution born out of a citizen's desire to make corruption history. Started in 2015, the MPC has organized panel discussions, lecture series, and it's also the host of the Nelly Bly Awards for Investigative Reporting, an annual celebration honoring outstanding investigative reporting work. Tonight, the museum proudly presents Disrupt, a film screening and debate series featuring impactful contemporary movies and a live roundtable discussion with the filmmakers and other special guests. Disrupt seeks to further NPC's mission to empower and educate the public by showcasing socially relevant films and engaging conversations about corruption and honest governance. And we couldn't have picked a better movie to start the series. The Swamp is a behind the scenes documentary following members of the Rebellious Freedom Caucus as they navigate friends and foes from both parties. Released in August of 2020 in the eye of the storm of a very polarizing presidential election, the film right now might feel like a tale from another time. But even though so much has happened since, just a quick scan through today's headlines get us to wonder if anything has changed at all. I hope you all have had an opportunity to watch the film ahead of tonight's discussion, but here's a quick look to help us refresh our minds. Let's watch the trailer of this one. Mr. President. I think we won the day, sir. I didn't run as someone to unify Washington. I ran to change Washington. I had really started to think about a Donald Trump presidency. He could bring the fight to a town that badly needed it. You know, when I first heard that term, I hated it. I said, oh, that's so hokey. If people are going to drain the swamp, like the president wants to do, they need better information about how this place is broken. And that's my mission in Congress. The hierarchy of power in Washington, D.C. is special interest groups, leadership, rank and file members. It's who can raise the money and the special interest groups control the money. The lobbyists, that's the swamp. Members of Congress are expected to pay for their committee assignments. 200,000, 500,000. It becomes a perpetual campaign. It's basically how to whore yourself out for money. You care about health care, the environment. You got to care where the money's coming from. Madison didn't count on partisanship. Politics of hate is the most productive technique for fundraising we have. You make yourself a target when you live like I live. Asshole. Do something! Everybody's so obsessed deciding what we should do. Get over yourself. As if we can do something. I'm coming after you, Kate. The only quid pro quo is Trump's commitment to drain the swamp. What has President Trump done to drain the swamp? Joining us tonight for an in-depth conversation about the film are directors Morgan Peem and Dan DiMauro. Peem and DiMauro are no strangers to corruption in American politics. They are the duo behind the hit Netflix documentary, Get Me Roger Stone, about the life and career of longtime Trump advisor. They have also directed Slumlord Millionaire, an episode of Netflix Dirty Money series, executive produced by Academy Award-winning documentary filmmaker Alex Gibney, and their latest collaboration is the two-part documentary special, The Men Who Sold the World Cup. Good evening to you both. Thank you so much for being part of tonight's event. Thank you, Veronica. Also participating in our roundtable discussion is veteran journalist and writer Charles Lewis. Chuck, as he likes to be called, is an award-winning investigative journalist and founder of the Center for Public Integrity and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. He's a former investigative producer for ABC News and CBS News program 60 Minutes. He's a MacArthur Fellow and a best-selling author. Good evening, Chuck. It's a great honor to have you here with us tonight. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. So I'll start off 
you know, asking some questions, uh, and then we're going to open to some audience questions as well. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send us in the chat box below. Morgan, then we'll start with you. Um, so the idea for the film came after you guys read Ken Buck's book, Drain the Swamp. What was it about the book that compelled you to, to turn your cameras onto this issue? Um, to be fair, it, it wasn't actually from reading Ken's book. Um, I mean, Ken's book happens to be about the same subject. And we thought after we learned about his book that he would be a good person to feature in our film. Um, you know, I think what Dan and I were interested in was, uh, it, it was actually in a lot of ways, Lawrence Lessig, who we feature in the film, who was a, a philosophical guide for us um, in his attack upon the systemic corruption that is at the heart of the paralysis of our government. And we wanted to go inside of Congress in a way that no cameras had ever before and to see the, the monster from the belly of the beast. And um, people didn't think that we would be able to do that because um, no members of Congress had really participated in a documentary during their um, during their tenure in office. I mean, a lot of uh, members of Congress leave and then they have this hand wringing come to Jesus moment when they're like, oh, it was so bad. You have no idea how bad it was. Um, but they don't really want to talk about it while they're in office because that's not in their vested interest. And they're because we were following them, um, there was always the possibility that they would do something that would uh, ruin their careers in the moment. Um, but we were able to find um, particularly these three Republican members who were willing to grant us all access without any conditions uh, to really embed in their offices and to see how things unfolded. And uh, we thought that would be an exceptional opportunity to bring the American public inside what is really the most important branch of our government and for uh, the American public to see how the sausage is made uh, and why it's not being made. Yeah, I guess piggybacking on that question, uh, Dan, you guys have selected Matt Gates, Thomas Massey and Ken Buck. Could you tell us a little bit about why these three characters, how was the process uh, of getting them involved, um, and were other characters that you considered that decided not to participate? Just tell us a little bit about that process, please. Sure. We, we did meet with a number of other Congress members, um, but, um, you know, me and Morgan have a philosophy kind of uh, of how we approach filmmaking, and and that's to, to really just provoke discussion and um, to attack these important issues and make sure we're not preaching to the choir. Um, you know, no offense to all of my great and amazing documentary colleagues, but a lot of times it's liberal filmmakers making films for a liberal, liberal audience. And, uh, you know, we often find that, um, you know, what's the point in that? You know, you have to speak to a wider audience especially when you're dealing with a, a, an institution like Congress where um, its core function is to come together and compromise to pass legislation to move the country forward. So it was our intent from the beginning to focus on Republicans to kind of make the argument that like you may disagree with them about, um, you know, issues two through 1000 ideologically uh, from a, a liberal perspective, but uh, there, there is some common ground on the number one issue, which is the systemic corruption of the Congress. And uh, as far as we're concerned, issues two through a thousand don't matter when uh, issue number one isn't going to be tackled as the priority. Right. Um, Chuck, throughout your career, you have really covered, um, or better yet, uncovered a lot of stories about corruption in politics and particularly in Washington. Uh, was there anything about this film that still surprised you in any way? Um, you know, it didn't, I mean, I, I was, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed hearing and watching everything, uh, but I also think um, honestly, I wasn't too surprised because I, you know, I, when you're around this kind of thing for a few decades, uh, you start to have scar tissue and you start to <laughs> accept that things have all gone to hell already, or they're just, they're going to, there'll be another problem or whatever it is. So I think 
uh, for, for journalists who, who look at these issues, uh, it's something that you're, you get used to, unfortunately. Uh, and I don't mean to be, uh, you know, I, I, it is important for people to expose the truth and to stand up to power. Uh, uh, and, you know, I feel like journalists do the best they can, we can, but uh, you can always have a little more, a few more hours in a day and maybe a few more people helping and <laughs> all kinds of other things that would bolster accountability and, and trans transparency and those kinds of things, which are a problem. A lot of these issues are not investigated. Uh, a lot of issues before committees that are never brought to before the committees. I mean, I mean that's a whole issue it's about accountability, and it, it's a problem. And um, so, anyway, I I don't mean to you know, make everyone uh, depressed, but <laughs> it would be useful if we were able to track this closely, daily, almost hourly. It'd be really interesting to do. It's not an easily done thing, I'll admit. But but um, this is important information, and a lot of those in power could care less what everyone else thinks, and they are they are going to do whatever the hell they want and freak many many times. And for journalists and and for others who are holding those accountable, there is this um, a little bit of a back and forth between these powers that be. Uh, one group wants to do whatever the hell they want, and another group has this idea that maybe there should be some accountability. I, I, favor, I favor the latter. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I should note that um, Chuck's 1998 book, The Buying of the Congress, is just a seminal work in this area. And so he is particularly well versed in our, the type of work that we've done is, is built upon a foundation that, that Chuck laid. But, you know, I think an, another thing that really drew us to the subject is uh, I had two tours as executive directors of good government organizations in New York and worked with a lot of the great good government organizations like Common Cause and, and reInvent Albany and really addressing New York corruption. And I was consistently told that the public doesn't care about corruption, that it's not a sexy issue. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, as Dan was saying, if you really examine our government, both in New York and on the federal level, um, you understand, particularly on the federal level, if everybody is in thrall of the special interests and the corporations, and all decisions are dictated around fundraising and around um, the money that you get from these special interest groups, that all the other issues that we care about, there can be no, no really profound action taken in any of those areas because the interest of the corporations and the special interest is to maintain the status quo. So every four years or two years, we have these elections and we talk about all of these issues. And unfortunately, what the public doesn't understand is that all the action that we wanna see, regardless of where we are on the political spectrum, is illusory um, because both parties are invested in maintaining essentially a status quo. And, and that's why we can never bang the drum hard enough to bring people's attention to this underlying truth about the, the dysfunction and the deficiencies of our governmental system. And as our problems grow greater as a country and as um, the corruption grows uh, even deeper into the swamp in Washington, um, we get even farther away from the possibility of having any solutions to the profound problems that we face as a nation. Right. Yeah, well, and I wanna ask about, uh, you guys mentioned Lassig as somebody that you guys really admire and look up to. Uh, what was the process like of bringing them on board? Um, because he's so instrumental in providing contacts and he kind of really helps kind of break down how the, the how rigged the system really is. Uh, was that something that you guys wanted from the very beginning to have uh, somebody uh, to really kind of dissect how that works or how Congress doesn't work? So how was that process of having him involved? Um, well, you know, he really is one of the leading um, you know, minds and forces on these important issues. And he was really, really, uh, you know, our Dante going into the inferno. Um, and, uh, you know, we did initial shooting with some of the Congress members, but essentially the first 
kind of sit down interview we did was with Larry and it was to, you know, and we, and we sat down with him for like five hours and, you know, this is what he lives and breathes and is what is most important to him. So he was more than happy to do that. And uh, in some ways we knew this was a verite film that we're kind of capturing a year of Congress. We don't know what's going to happen. We have some ideas, but you know, you follow some story storylines, maybe they don't, they don't pan out. There's only so much you could fit into a single film. But, but what Lessig helped us do is just kind of like lay the foundational groundwork of, of which that we could work off of just to understand the, um, the dynamics at play and have that one expert voice that could not just be the Dante for us as we embarked into the swamp and filming this movie, but uh, for the viewers themselves. Yeah, um, and I guess speaking of experts, Chuck, you've been walking, you know, the halls of Congress for decades now and really gotten to know many of these people that the film kind of shows a little bit. Um, so what was it like to have them behind closed doors but without the cameras? Uh, well, it was very strange. <laughs> this is a short answer. Um, uh, Many, many times you would be stonewalled by members of Congress that they would not want to speak to you. They would uh, limit the time, maybe instead of 30 seconds down to 10, uh, if, if they were rushed that day. And and uh, and anyway, I've always found it frustrating uh, because there's a little bit of veneer there. They're, they want everyone to be happy and kumbaya and how exciting it is to be here and there. But they often dodge or don't uh, don't talk about or reveal what some of the things are that are happening there. And most most journalists, I don't I don't think most journalists actually track a lot of these things. I mean, let's be honest. There's a lot of other things happening in the world besides Congress, and and um, so it's, it's it's an uphill fight for for muckrakers to investigate the bastards, whoever they are. There are a lot of them. And, and it depends on the subject and, and it's time and energy also is an issue for folks when they're doing an investigation, pulling things, trying to get records. Some records are sealed. Good luck with that. You know, and it's these are there are a lot of challenges. That doesn't mean it can't be done in a beautiful way and investigate the bastards. That can happen, but it doesn't always. Happen. And um, it, that's frustrating in the extreme, at least for me. I, I think that's so true. I mean, uh, I think Chuck would agree that politicians are among the worst people to interview because they just are, are fantasists and they are trying to spin you into a narrative. Uh, I know from my former career as a political journalist, uh, what was so frustrating is the quant uh, the quality and the nature of the conversations that I would have with politicians off the record uh, was a, a completely different world than the one that they would be willing to have on the record. Um, one of the things that drew um, Dan and I to Roger Stone as a subject initially was he was willing to say the quiet parts out loud and he was willing to be candid about his villainy, um, which is, we, we were, that was so refreshing. It's like, well, I, it's not that Roger Stone doesn't practice what all the other political consultants and the, and the powerhouses and the, and the, the consultant lobbyist complex practice in Washington, D.C., and to be fair, on both sides of the aisle. Um, but he was just willing to be candid about it. Um, you know, I think that that's also why we landed on these three members of Congress um, is because they were willing to talk about these issues in an unvarnished way. And to be frank, um, no Democrats were willing to talk about it. And in part, in part it was because I would conjecture is because they were in the majority at the time. And, and when you're in the majority, you're particularly beholden to leadership. Um, and you don't want to piss off leadership because then your stock falls and you, you don't get all the goodies. Um, and so, sure, uh, you know, if you speak uh, off the record with Democrats and Republicans, I would say one that they have in common is if they actually care about what they're doing, they're despondent because they see their impotence uh, and they see how dysfunctional the system is. Um, and then they also know that they're all trapped by a system um, but when you're in the majority, it's everything is rainbows um, because uh, we have such a wonderful speaker. We have such a major, such a wonderful majority leader. We're 
getting so much done for the American public. And it's easier when you're in the minority to be the, in the peanut gallery. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's another reason we went to these Republicans, because quite frankly, they were willing to be candid. Um, and, you know, for, for Dan and I, from being on the opposite side, truth be told, of the, of the political spectrum from these Republicans, the fact that they would talk about corruption in a way where we were like, oh, this is actually the thing that we agree upon. Um, when you're talking about this, this scathing indictments of the system, it's like, wow, this is like the very first thing, like this is the only thing that I can think about that we agree upon. You know, we thought at this time of great polarization and division in the nation, um, don't we owe it to the American public to try to find some sort of um, union uh, around these issues that are of the greatest importance to all of our lives? And we thought maybe if we can have these Republicans, if, if I can see these uh, uh, right wing Republicans and I can understand where they're coming from and there's actually a point of agreement between us and them, Maybe the American public can be brought into that conversation too. And maybe all of us can say, look, we don't need to agree upon any other issue, but at least we should all understand that the government should belong to the people and not to the corporations and the special interests. Um, and it's, it's a very difficult message for all of us to accept because we don't wanna believe that our party is part of the problem. But look, the truth is, as we show in our film, like if you have to buy your committee assignments, if, if you have to pay money in order to be the chair of a committee, that you don't get to be the leader, uh, either the, the majority leader or the minority leader, the speaker, the, you know, those are the people who raise the most money and who use fundraising as a weapon to control their members and who have to actually, they have to play ball with the special interests on a level that is greater than anybody else. So as long as you have that fundamentally corrupt system, um, you know, it doesn't matter who is in charge. And we've seen that. Look, we've, we've had the Democrats completely in control of, of both houses of Congress and the presidency, the Republicans. You know, this is we've seen every iteration of this and we've only seen the same results. Um, and yet every single cycle, our party tries to convince us that if only our party were in power, it would be this panacea. Um, and of course, like, you know, I mean, Chuck's been a lot around far longer than, than Dan and I have been in this, but, you know, anybody with any type of historical perspective could just see how, uh, how ludicrous that is. Um, and yet we still, because of this, um, you know, what, what Lessig talks about in our film about the politics of hate, you know, if we can keep pressing our base's buttons and being like, oh, it's just those other bad guys, um, then we can keep distracting from the issues. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember that, you know, the, when I was growing up, the Democratic Party was all about, you know, uh, we're the working class party, we're the labor party, Republicans are the party of big money, you know, look at them, they have all these mega donors, right? And then, you know, I think when we saw Obama outraised dramatically, the Republicans, um, the Democrats were like, wow, like we can actually raise more money than them by also going right to all the, the corporatocracy. And, and, you know, just the New York Times recently had a story about that this last cycle, the Democrats took more dark money than the Republicans did, right? Uh, and none of us want to grapple with those inconvenient truths about who really underlies the decisions made by both parties. And it's not the people and it's not the base the ideology is a smokescreen to protect the influence of the donor class. Yeah, no, it's interesting that you say that because uh, I was reading one of your interviews when the first the move first came out, uh, and you say that um, uh, you wanted so let me get it here. Uh, you wanted to offer a chance to the American public to take them behind closed doors in Congress for the first time and show them how the sausage is made. So I guess, you know, even though it's a completely different president, the Democrats have majority both in the Senate and the House, uh, it's still the same sausage recipe. They just change the packaging. Yeah, um, I think that's right. And I just think the the, the kind of uh, evidence of that is just the uh, inability of Congress to do anything, um, whether it was um, just in this past year. I mean, like they could certainly, uh, they'll always pass a defense budget and they'll always jack up the, uh, the military budget. Um, they'll, they'll pass some bills to, uh, 
that are essentially giveaways to the corporations, but um, they're not actually doing anything for the American people. And, and you know, that's, that's the, the result of a broken system. And I think Wessig, Wessig says in the film, you know, like um, at a certain point, um, like what's the point of winning elections in a broken system if you don't have the capacity to govern? Um, they've been uh, completely castrated in their capacity to actually govern, to actually pass legislation that uh, makes sense. And as Morgan said, it the smokescreen is there. Um, the you know particularly the Democrats will talk a large game about these big sweeping legislative bills that encompass all this uh, great stuff that's going to uh, you know uh, save the American people. And uh, give them, you know, uh, everything they could ever dream of, from you know, voting reform to uh, to uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, election reform, but also to like healthcare and everything. Uh, they can never do that. I mean, and that's not how Congress was meant to function anyway. Um, another one of the problem is that they they sell a false bill of goods. That essentially, if it, if one party is able to uh, essentially have tyranny over the of all branches of the government they're just going to pass all this great stuff and then they don't do it they they always have some sort of foil oh now it's the, the filibuster that's the reason now it's joe manchin um actually they're smart enough to know these things aren't going to pass they want to tell the public that they're going to do all these big sweeping things it's just the republicans or it's uh mcconnell or it's joe manchin or it's the courts they'll always have an excuse for why it doesn't happen but uh frankly it doesn't happen because they don't want it to happen because their donors don't want it to happen yeah i think that's such a great point that dan just made look um lyndon johnson passed the voting rights act with racist democrats uh, voting for a, a bill that was antithetical to their worldview i mean the idea that build back better was foiled by Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema, like in the 11th hour is ludicrous. Lyndon Johnson had been like, first day, hey, Joe Manchin, there's gonna be the Joe Manchin Memorial Highway and the Kristen Cinema Airport, like now what do you want? Um, but the fact is like that bill was never meant to pass in the first place, it was a message. Uh, it was meant to say, put forward an agenda and then for it to be foiled and then to use it as electoral issue to point at the Republicans and be like, look what they didn't let us do. Um, and the, I would say that the, to demonstrate that is there are certain bills like the National Defense Authorization Act or the Farm Bill or certain the budget bills, like those are the only bills that always pass, right? But what you don't see is while this, all this intrigue was going around uh, on with the Build Back Better, and I understand about reconciliation that it was a different process, but like they let the National Defense Authorization Act, which is very important to both Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, just sail through, right? If you wanted to actually have leverage over these senators, you would have kept that hostage because so many people on both sides of the aisle, um, that is their bread and butter is the military spending bill. Um, and yet nobody was trying to leverage that. Um, and, and of course, we all know that these bills have so many uh, things attached to them that are outside of the purview of those bills. But if you were really trying serious about trying to get some of these uh, major programs across the finish line, you know, there are ways working within the system that that could have been done if that was the serious intention of passing these bills as opposed to messaging to the base and using them as fundraising letters. Um, and so we really didn't see a good faith effort for these changes to be, you know, for these bills to be enacted. Uh, and then the other thing is, it's just so important, and I hope this our film conveyed this to a degree, is that um, Matt Gates calls it the corruption tax, is that every single bill that is passed has some sort of giveaways to the corporations and, and this, is, this is another thing that um, is upsetting to people, but you know, you'll have some massive emergency relief bill um, that of course, 70% of it, 60% of it will do wonderful things for people who are terribly in need. But unfortunately, everybody knows that's also an opportunity um, to you know, help out a whole bunch of special interests. The first people who are online are the people who are trying to tuck all their own uh, self-interest into the bill. And every single bill, carries 
hundreds of millions of dollars in corrupt spending um, that is uh, the, that is like basically uh, necessary for it to get through the Congress is to just make sure that you know the special interests are getting their keep um, with legislation that is passed. That is how perverse our system is. Um, and the media is not invested in telling or your Chuck is. Um, but what the media is interested in is the food fight between the parties and the horse race. Who's running here? What's running here? How much money did they raise? It's perverse that we spend so much uh, time talking about ag ag aggrandizing how much money these candidates ra uh, raised instead of being like, huh, how did you raise that 15, 20, 25 million dollars, 100 million dollars? Where did all that money come from? And what are you going to do for all that money? I mean, I, the, and the American public viscerally understands it, but the, the media is so complicit in uh, not bringing our attention back to the consequence of this perverse amount of money in the system and that no, the people who give that money are not, are not us. The people who give that money are the people who are invested in a very specific outcome in Congress on very specific legislation. Um, and they pay for that. And if you sit, for instance, if you sit on the Judiciary Committee, there's a whole bunch of corporations. You, the first day you're there, you get a check. Everybody on the committee gets a check from, you know, all these corporations who have business in front of the Judiciary Committee, Republicans and Democrats alike. Um, and, and that's what we need to understand as the American public is that we are not the people running the Congress right now. And it's not the Congress members who are running the Congress. It's the people who are, um, you know, the, the people who the members of Congress are beholden to for this endless trough of money. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, 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 I hear you saying it's like crazy to 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 kind of, you know, um, agree with you, because at the same time, it feels like a game. It, it really is the gamification of politics. If we think about, you know, this idea of, you know, going back and forth and what we're going to, you know, withhold this from you unless you give me this, um, you know. Um, Chuck, what is your perception about all of this? Why is it so hard to change the uh, the culture uh, in politics today? Well, I mean, you know, as you know, we have 100 senators and 435 House members. Uh, in some cases, they come and they go, particularly in the House, because of the, they're shorter uh, pegs in terms of time uh but uh you know it's that's i'm i'm agreeing with dan and morgan and what you've said i mean there's no question about this uh and the uh, power is a big deal and the cash flow is a, a big deal for for all of those uh who would like to benefit from that frankly and um the american people don't generally know a whole lot about what we're discussing here deeply. I, I don't think so. And um, anyway, it's it's not a new problem, as we all know. This has been a problem, to be honest, for, for more than 200 years. I mean, this is this is it's gotten worse because the amount of money is larger. Uh, uh, Congress is larger itself than it was, obviously, in the 1700s. And and um, so this this is not a new problem. It's but it's 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 maybe the worst we've ever seen it problem because of the sheer volume of people and money that's being spent. We've never in our lifetimes, we've never seen anything remotely like this. I don't think as, as, as we are right now in, in the last few years. Uh, and and it's it's outrageous. And and uh, folks don't really know too much about how to deal with that or they don't want to deal with it. That's a whole nother issue uh, for, for some of these so-called powers that be. Uh, so uh, it's not an easy thing to solve in 10 minutes or or even a week or even a year. I mean, it's uh, this is a challenge for anyone who cares about democracy that these things need to be cleared and, and, and understood completely. Um, one of the books that we worked on over the years was uh, called The Buying of the, of the Congress. Uh, of the pre this is the president, sorry, but I also did the Congress. <laughs> and uh, the buying, this this book was, was is about the same thing. Each president, how many donors they have, uh, how much money did they give, all of them from Clinton to, to Bush to you name it. And 
And it's not like it was a brilliant thing. I mean, it was pretty easily got, and it's from records. You just pull it together, and then you try to con confront people. Some of them will talk. Some of them won't talk. Um, uh, and and frankly, this is out of date. It's 2004. We we're ready probably for another one. I mean, uh, but but this is these are big challenges. This is a hard work. Uh, it, it there's a certain tenacity that is required in tracking these things and confronting members of Congress. Uh, and uh, there aren't that many reporters who have the time or the energy or their editors will or will not assign them to do some of these things it, it, it you know for lots of potential reasons including fewer people as journalists who aren't working on this kind of stuff so anyway it's a it's a huge challenge and it's it's not going to change overnight unfortunately despite the uh, the great work you guys are doing uh it's just frustrating to watch and i i don't know how we're we're not going to easily change this tonight or anytime soon but but i do think it's invaluable for the public to recognize reality uh and and, and understand it and uh the other thing i've always been fascinated by would be to juxtapose what we're describing here in the u.s with uh, other countries around the world, because uh, this is not only a U.S. problem. I think this is a, a, a global problem. Um, we have more than 200 countries in the world, and um, this is probably a very, very serious problem literally across the world. So um, that doesn't mean we're so solving that tonight will be hard, I think. But <laughs> but I but I do see the importance of, of this issue. And um, it's really depressing that after all these years of discussion, I came to Washington in 1974. Uh, it hasn't changed, except the money is larger. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it drives, I, I think it probably drives us all up the wall. And we're not alone. Um, so I don't know how we break that, uh, how we challenge that. Uh, it's hard to do for one person or four people when you're dealing with a few thousand journalists, not journalists, uh, members of Congress and others, it's a uh, good luck. Uh, I mean, that, I'm not making light of it. I just mean it's a big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would uh, I add on to that because obviously, um, Chuck, you've done such great work just uh, <clears throat> exposing the failures of our media and um, just how gross and disgusting that world could be in terms of the corporate media. But, you know, like, as journalists, you know, there's a lot of great journalists out there working. And, uh, you know, to be fair, some of them within the corporate media system. Um, but most of them are now kind of working outside the system. And hopefully, you know, like, we just have to, to keep pushing to just um, educate and inform more and more the kind of um, uh, the corruption that's making the, the system dysfunctional and and try to convince people, you know, it's not the food fight that CNN and MSNBC and uh, Fox News wants you to focus on that they present to you, which is supposed to be the important news. Um, and it's, it's much more complex and mind numbing, but important to under, understand the infrastructure of Congress and our government and why it's so broken. And, you know, there's a particular, you know, like this particular kind of uh, characteristics for a person who wants to be a politician. And I think like a lot of them do want to improve government and do good for people. Um, and those good people who enter Congress get trapped inside a system because the leadership is has already been corrupted for decades and they understand that um raising money is the is the number one prerogative and uh the problem is when winning elections is your number one priority uh that means fundraising is your number one priority that means being beholden to the special interest and the donors is your number one priority everything else is secondary um, like the literal uh, existence 
and reason for having a legislature. So if that's their number one priority, nothing is, is ever going to be done, and we have to keep calling them out. And uh, it's not going to be stopped tonight, as you say. But um, you know, we just got to keep, keep pushing to make people understand that this is an important issue, and it's a, an issue that's increasingly recognized as an important issue by people across the political spectrum. And unfortunately, the deficiencies that we see from the government and from our media only helps to further the status quo uh, for various different reasons, but it, but it also further erodes the trust that we're supposed to have in these institutions. And we hope that that erosion of trust can manifest into good government movements, perhaps nonpartisan movements, to fix the corruption of our system, rather than the scarier outcome, which is like the rise of more authoritarian fascist elements that are in the underbelly of our society. You know, one of the reasons I've been so, uh, you know, serving on the board of advisors of the Museum of Political Corruption um, has been important to me and why um, I'm so invested in the museum's mission is because this isn't academic in nature. I mean, this really, I can't stress enough just how important this issue is. You know, we've talked about our film as a, a cry for help from the members of Congress. And I think that even if you like your member of Congress, if you had a candid conversation with your member of Congress, your member of Congress is frustrated and despondent um, because your member is not accomplishing what he or she invested their lives, to, like, put all this effort to going into Congress to think that they would accomplish something for their constituents. And, and the fact is they are failing and it's not their fault. It's because as Dan was saying, they are trapped by the system. And if you believe uh, that we have, as I do, very profound problems as a country and as a world, you know, if you think that climate change is an existential threat to the world, if we do not have the capacity in Congress to address climate change, because of all the special interests. Uh, and it's not just the oil and gas uh, interests, but there's so many interests. Um, you know, it, it, labor has so many interests in not allowing for, uh, um, you know, all sorts of uh, innovations in clean uh, fuel technologies to move forward. I mean, across the spectrum, nobody wants their ox gourd. And they will carve out the reasons for why this shouldn't be done to them. And they'll be like, oh, we should do everything else except for what affects me. And the fact is that Congress is a confluence of many interest groups as represented by these members. And these members make sure that they look out for their interest groups. And so whatever is this important issue to you, um, if you think it's if it's climate change, if you think if it's the debt, you know, if you think that the, the deficit is uh, crushing the country, we never reduce spending as a nation because what happens is all these spending bills are the democrats come and they be like they say we'll give you hey republicans you can actually have all these things that you want if we can have what we want nobody's like let's both draw down our spending the 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 compromise is always more 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 um so no, whatever issue is important to you just know like we are in an inescapable quagmire right now and and this is why i i really hope that people will engage with this film and not just think about it as like a snapshot of the Trump era. Like I, I look at it every day and I just think how illuminating it is for now, just like Charles's book is still like, you can read this 1998, but it's, it's like, it's illuminating for now. And yet our problems keep getting worse and worse. And we're crossing the Rubicon. Um, we're getting to the point of no return here. And unless we start taking corruption seriously, uh, and if we are just going to fixate on like electing this person or that person, we are are missing, you know, the the forest for the trees. Like we we are just we are completely um, deluding ourselves how we're going to fix our problems as a country. And these are very important problems. Uh, and these are the the museum of political corruption is not invested in academia. This is these are the core problems that are are plaguing us as a nation. Yeah. Well, let's open to some questions from the audience. Um, uh, can you put that back on, please? Okay. 
um, from I. Metzner, then talked about the core function of Congress as making compromises. How does the politics of hate affect people's ability to compromise? Is it just for show or are we crossing a line? That's a, it's a really great point. And you know, it, it's what's so difficult. Uh, it, it was one of the greatest challenges of us making this film and trying to present it as honestly as possible. Um, because you'll see there's a great irony to what we're covering, which is Matt Gates does become the first Republican to denounce PAC money. Um, and that's a growing number of Democrats who are denouncing uh, PAC money. And that's generally um, the politicians in both parties who would be, I guess, perceived from just kind of a media perspective removed as more for the fringes of their party, the more progressive members uh, of the, the Democrats and you know the more kind of uh, freedom caucus or Trumpers or kind of libertarians in in the Republicans. Certainly not the establishment of the party, which we talk about a lot of just being so entrenched with these interests. Unfortunately, some of these people have figured out the way to break out of the donor system in order to fundraise to maintain their. Uh, seat in Congress is to play the politics of hate. And Larry Lessig says in the film how the politics of hate is the greatest fundraising tool and traces it very, very much back to Newt Gingrich, who kind of uh, created uh, uh, the atmosphere of our uh, current kind of political system in Congress, where um, it's a, you know, a lot of yelling at each other and not a lot of compromising and even to Reagan, who kind of made compromise a dirty word, whereas you might betray your base if you're compromising with the other side. To break away from the, the donor system, you have to play to the extremes of the bases, and you have to basically say, I'm the good guy, they're the bad guy. And it's kind of this like very kind of a uh, uh problem that they create. Like it, it's very circular in its logic, but in a lot of ways, like, you know, I am very much a fan of um, kind of the ideology of Bernie Sanders. If, if anything, me and Morgan, we very progressive on, on most issues and think that Bernie represents our worldview probably more than a, a lot of politicians do. Doesn't say we agree with him 100%, but that's part of the problem too. Why do you have to agree with them 100%? So unfortunately, the only reason that Matt Gates is able to fundraise and break out of the PAC donor system is to just increase conflict, be increasingly inflammatory, say kind of overtly racist or coded racist things that appeal to his base. He has one of the most conservative districts in the country. And uh, similarly, people like AOC, she will be very polarizing as well because she's trying to drive those small dollar donations and of course, they've broken out of the past system, but now they have to play this game of the politics of hate, and it's very unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, Congress is not, uh, compromise isn't a dirty word, it's an American word. I mean, our system was built for there to be a compromise between factions um, so that we would have uh, decisions that were representative of the American people and not any just one, one group. Um, we have to stop vilifying um, members of our own party for engaging in any type of compromise. That, that isn't um, uh, some sort of um, surrender. Um, you know, I, our, our greatest pieces of legislation were uh, in our American history were built upon compromise. Um, and, and I think it's important to understand that, um, you know, we, we now we look always at these omnibus bills, like everything is stuck into these bills. Um, that's not how the New Deal was passed, right? It was passed in these pieces that were broken up. That's how you actually accomplish extraordinary change. There are, on all these bills, there's a, there is bipartisan consensus on a number of these issues if they only broke them out into single bills. But again, the parties are not invested in finding compromise and passing those bills um, because then you're giving a win to the other party, oh no, like they, they they can actually claim that they did something, which is like actually when you're in the in the in the majority now, it's like to fluster the other party that never let them have a win, right? 
But, you know, that's not what the American public wants, right? The Republican Party right now argues fundamentally that government is broken and dysfunctional. The Democratic Party, the counter argument is that that um, that government can solve problems. But if actually the idea behind the Democratic Party is only to message the idea that government can solve problems and not to actually practically solve problems, to pass the legislation where there can be bipartisan consensus, then, you know, the Democrats are are completely destroying any argument for government to be a solution to these problems. And essentially, we've just accepted uh, the complete futility of the uh, even the concept of governance, uh, which is what the American public thinks at this point. They just think like, oh, my God, like we're completely screwed and they're not wrong. Um, and so, you know, if there's there are, you know, I we see in these big pieces of legislation, they could find a chord on some of these things and there could be wins for the American public. But the parties don't think about it as as for the the the, the interest of the American public. They think about it for the self their self interest from electoral prospects. Um, and so you know this whole this whole thing about the omnibus bill, like uh, th there's a reason we should we should all be suspicious of omnibus bills. You know, uh, the, you can even find consensus on some limited forms of of gun control among Republicans. You know, on criminal justice reform, uh, on all these issues, like there are. There are areas where we could pass bills where we could move the country forward, but we don't want to do that because the, the objective is not really to pass legislation. The objective is to vilify the other party so that we can pull more money into our party. Right. And I just want to add well, something I found like, uh, the, you know, extremely um, upsetting example of this was just uh you know in the in the wake of the killing of george floyd and black lives matter movement there are some republicans willing to uh support a nationwide ban on chokeholds uh by withholding funding to police departments that didn't institute certain rules and training but instead of the democrats breaking out the legislation that they could see eye to eye on the republicans with they instead created a giant sweeping bill to say this is how we're going to magically change our society and end all these racist policies. And what happened, they never intended to pass that. They just wanted to use it as a, an electoral talking point to say, look how bad the Republicans are. They wouldn't let us pass this sweeping legislation. Meanwhile, they could have broken out pieces of those legislations and we could literally have a national ban on chokeholds right now. And I just found that particularly disturbing because that is not how the media covers it. It's like, um, the, and you know, Wes, of course, talks about this in films, nothing new. Charles has covered it for decades. Um, just the increasing kind of partisan nature of, of the news media and selectively covering things and often, often just parroting the talking points of the politicians who uh, they want to uh, support. Yeah, I just wanted to also just point out this this idea of one house bills because I, I think a lot of Americans don't understand this too. So when I covered Albany, you know, um, the the New York State Assembly every year passed sweeping campaign finance reform legislation that would institute a matching fund system, and everybody would applaud then Speaker Sheldon Silver and say. Sheldon Silver is really for matching funds, uh, and it's the big bad Republican state Senate that won't let that pass. Well, uh, I always knew that Shelley Silver was the last person who wanted matching funds to pass. But as long as it's just a press release and it will never be enacted legislation, you can always be on the side of the angels. Um, and this is one of the games that our parties play. So a bill like HR1, which we advocate strongly for in our film, like we know a lot of Democrats are not on board with a matching fund system. Um, for instance, you know, we heard a lot about the Congressional Black Caucus was not for independent redistricting because a number of the districts held by their members are gerrymandered districts that were built for their members. Um, unfortunately, when, but you can, if you're, if you're sure that that's not actually gonna be passed. Sure, you can pass principled legislation all the time, or you, you know, but if it's not gonna get through the other house, like it's completely meaningless, but you can go back to your constituents and say that, oh, look at all the stuff that we did. We, we, uh, we you know, we repealed the AUMF. It was just the other house that it wasn't for it. Um, but when 
uh, when Shelley Silver, when the Republicans took, when the Democrats took back the state Senate uh, in 2005, and there was both houses controlled by the Democrats in New York State, then all of a sudden that bill about campaign finance reform suddenly got stuck. Uh, why did that not get instantly passed? That the And it was because nobody ever really wanted it passed all along. Um, and that's another thing that we need to understand about the legislation that is being proposed by our parties. Like it's virtue signaling so often uh, because they know it's never going to be enacted. And the votes aren't even there within our own parties that just manifest as long as there's no potential for that bill to actually become law. Right. Well, I did want to expand a little bit more about this idea of politics of hate and to talk about also the role of corporate media, not only in engaging in it, but really uh, uh, enabling it to the point that they actually profit from it, right? Uh, especially because Chuck, you have been such a huge champion of nonprofit journalism, specifically to free the press from the need to, and the influence of corporate money. Uh, but at the same time, we really have seen how much local and independent news organizations uh, all over in America, particularly investigative journalism newsrooms, are really being impacted by the cutbacks in the sector. So I wanted to get your perspective on that. How, how do we bridge this gap to make independent journalism viable and sustainable? Uh, <clears throat> along with the other things we've talked about, is this is another, this is a very serious problem and um, I mean essentially uh, I don't know how it'll change uh, I, when I look at what's happened uh, uh, the options uh, aren't there and the interest is not there and these, these things that we're talking about that you just mentioned uh, there's a reluctance or a non-existent <laughs> presence uh, by a lot of the folks in the country, uh, both Congress and otherwise. And so it's very hard, frankly, to get anyone to be together on anything in this country. I mean, I, I actually think we're in a really strange time. Uh, maybe that's been a problem for decades, but it seems like it's gotten worse as, as far as I can tell. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question completely, but can try it. We can try again if you'd like. Uh, Do you feel, Chuck, that um, just some of the kind of, you know, the writers kind of trying to break out of the kind of corporate media system and going to places like Substack, like, is that encouraging at all to you? No, I think that is encouraging. I mean, part of the problem is we we have lost hundreds and well, probably thousands now of newspapers. I mean, newspaper. Uh, coverage by specific newspapers and so um <clears throat> we're looking at a situation where it, it's 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 inadequate it's it un, unsubstantial it could be much more substantial it, it's not happening that way partly because of the media we lose six or seven hundred newspapers that go under uh, uh total carnage uh, of some of the most important media systems, journalism, and not just uh, newspapers either, uh, more broadly, that's a problem. And so then we're shocked, shocked that uh, the citizens are are not very liter literal or literary of, of understanding about anything because they're not paying attention to these things either. They're not reading the articles. They're not, you know, so this is a mess. I mean, it's a significant problem. It, this is not a unique problem to the, to uh, to the U.S., it's a problem across the world. Uh, Japan, Europe, uh, lots of lots of other parts of the world have all run into this problem, where the media is has become more less less. I was going to say more inept uh, and and uh, more thin in terms of uh, staff, and um, and and then uh, you also have the owners. Welcome to this reality. Uh, there are owners who have their own agendas um, that are really not into investigative reporting. They're into looking good uh, to their constituents and, you know, other things that, that, yes, they own the newspaper, but it might not be a very good newspaper and, you know, things like that. So the, all these things are a big sort of bollocked up mess. I mean, I'll be honest with you. There's no consistency 
we have elite newspapers that are are respected in this country. Um, uh, but the problem with that is uh, that is mostly the elites, the most uh, wealthy folks uh, who are, are reading, you know, the New York Times and and the Economist and all these other uh, publications, which are you know excellent publications. I'm not trying to put them down, but that it's sort of a pretty thin going with uh, investigative reporting and, and that kind of information. It's hard to find. That kind of work is extremely difficult. Uh, time is money. It takes months and years to write an investigative project or whether it's a book, an article, a series of articles. Uh, and so uh, this is not unique to the U.S. This is a problem globally, 200 plus countries. Um, and um, that just that alone is irritating and frustrating and lamentable. Uh, the question is, how can that improve? And and obviously that should be directly related to the Congress and the powers that be supposedly uh, regarding democracy in our country. All of those, all of these things are completely related, uh, but it's not at all clear what the outcome's gonna be here. I, I haven't seen any great exciting new thing that that shows, gosh, we're, we've gotten out of the woods here. It's gonna be great from here on. I don't. I don't hear anyone thinking that, or saying that, or seeing that. And um, and I. I'm not trying to make light of it. I, I think it's quite serious. Uh, and 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 that's not unrelated to ignorance, and and un, un, people being untethered about their own reality of their own country. Starting here with the U.S., but frankly, there are many other countries that have the same problem. Yeah, and let's get another question from our audience. From Bruce Broder, it seems that the ship of corruption needs to be turned around incrementally. Where would you begin? What is some of the low hanging fruit for government reform? Is there any low hanging fruit? Um, I would say that, you know, in, in the film, you see like this kind of moment towards the beginning where um, Matt Gates and Ro Khanna, a Democrat from California, Silicon Valley, um, you know, they kind of do this thing like, uh, um, let's talk about some things that people might be surprised that we agree with. And, um, you know, uh, honestly, like, they always, uh, if the kind of progressive wing can, uh, can overlap and agree with things uh, with you know, the more um, Trump wing of the party, let's say in Congress, they could overlap on issues like uh, repealing the AUMF, uh, the, the authorization for the use of military force. Um, then like, you know, like things could happen, but they, they always come up against the, the establishment. Like, but I do think that like, if, as Morgan was saying, if they could break up HR1 and kind of try to pass certain aspects of it, like maybe you can get something on, on, on some things passed that both sides can agree on. That's just not the way it's functioning right now. Um, and unfortunately, like even just with the Democrats in charge, they kind of uh, communicated that it was a top priority to do HR1 now that, you know, they have the, the presidency and the Congress and everything. But, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, they tied it to voting rights, so had no chance of passing. And there was never an intention, like, why isn't there a discussion to break up that bill and start to work on some of these reforms? Because it's just not a priority for the public or for the, uh, the politicians to, to do that. Um, as to what specifically there's some bipartisan consensus on, I could just tell you generally, and this is something that, you know, uh, you know, someone like Noam Chomsky has been at the core of kind of his writing about politics for, for decades. It's like when you poll the public on issues generally um, in a kind of non-political manner, there is consensus on on things like you wouldn't even think there's consensus on if you watch the media, but you might kind of understand when you have like private conversations at the dinner table, that sort of thing. Like the overwhelmingly, uh, the overwhelming majority of people support, like 
improvements in the healthcare system because it's too expensive. They support the idea that there's way too much money in politics. They support the idea that um, politicians corruptly draw draw district lines. Um, as if uh, if there's any way to test those things, I, I don't know. Maybe Charles R. Morgan could, could answer that, but um, I don't know. It's 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 not looking good. I mean, look, there is, as you said, like the, there's public polling. There was public polling during the heat of the uh, last presidential race that, for instance, like 93 percent of Americans think that we should have a right to clean air and clear drink and clean drinking water, um, you know, on on uh, affordable health care, on, you know, on most of the issues that are supposedly so polarizing in America, there is actually broad consensus. Um, and um, it's not, as, as you said, it, it's not posed that way. Um, I do feel like that, um, you know, there has been, uh, to some degree, there's been a, fetish, a fetishization of corporations uh, where, oh, we, we love this corporation. Um, but I think more broadly speaking, uh, Americans realize that it's a rigged game. Um, I think that that is something that, for instance, that, that Trump and Bernie Sanders were talking about that I think there is broad consensus on from the left and from the right about the, that corporations have way too much power in our system. Um, uh, that I think there's increasingly uh, that same feeling about tech companies. Um, you know, you see um, in um, in the Judiciary Committee, you know, there is a bipartisan consensus that there's something has to be done to rein in the extraordinary power of the of the tech giants. Um, you know, I think that um, there there are things that we can do to change the the system around uh, that is just so favoring corporations over the people right now. Um, we are hobbled in addressing. You know, it's all well and good to talk about federal matching funds, um, but as long as Citizens United stands and I can just have unlimited dark money uh, flood into the system, it's almost a disadvantage to have a public matching fund system. Uh, because like you're bringing a knife to a gunfight. Um, and so, uh, but I do think that things like, depending upon what state you are in, you're incensed right now about partisan gerrymandering. Um, both parties have gotten a taste of their own medicine. Uh, you know, we, we've seen it used for great effect by uh, who, whichever party is in control. Um, I think some sort of equitable um, redistricting pro uh, you know, process is something that is possible. Um, I also think that some sort of, um, you know, th there have been movements to kind of move away from the hyperpolarization of politics. And I think that uh, Americans like in our core are, uh, we're willing to give that a chance. Um, but what we're fed all the time is ammunition to make us more and more incensed. And, um, and we're told that compromise is surrender. Um, and we just, there has to be an understanding of a greater good. And I think when we talk about existential threats like climate change or, um, you know, with what is going on with Russia and Ukraine, now this uh, resurgence of real concern about the possibility of, of nuclear conflict, um, you know, these are fundamentally the issues that we should be coming together around. Um, you know, there was a great hope that just like with 9-11, that the pandemic would allow us to see that we're all in the same boat. Um, but yet both parties immediately polarized uh, and both um, made it made it a, a, a battle of, of partisan, um, you know, extremes. Um, you know, I, I there's there's been people speculated. What if Trump had immediately embraced the vaccine? Um, would there have been great suspicion among Democrats about the vaccine if Trump had been, um, you know, the the big cheerleader for the vaccine? I, you know, it's it's not it's not impossible knowing that um, whatever Trump was saying that uh, it was anathema to whatever Democrats thought. Um, you know, we it's like nature uh, has given us chance after chance to uh, to find a way to come together, uh, and and we need to to look at that very seriously. Um, we have to understand that a, a divided nation is one that falls, um, and that. It, our country was was designed for us to build consensus, for us to work through our differences, not for us to hunker down in our corners uh, and just wait for the country to fall apart. 
Right. And even during the pandemic, when so much was at stake, uh, they did pass a bill. And that was a stimulus bill that was the largest bailout program in American history that greatly, prof you know, uh, helped more corporations. I, I, so there was an opportunity to do the right thing, and yet. It, it's, you know, and that's a perfect example of such a mixed bill, right? Like, uh, yes, I mean, that was a humongous giveaway to corporations, and yet it was also a tremendous boon for working Americans. Um, you know, that is uh, was a real opportunity for all the people who were, were suffering so mightily from the pandemic. Like uh, I know Dan and I were on unemployment at that time, that additional unemployment insurance, uh, that helped us mightily. Um, and that was an opportunity for us to make a really robust argument for the good that government can be. Um, but at the same time, like we weren't willing to uh, talk about that bill with any type of um, intellectual um, fairness um, because it's always it always has to be one thing or the other. So we couldn't be like, there's some wonderful elements of this bill. And it was also a massive corporate giveaway. Um, you know, that that's like that that was a defiance of the orthodoxy or or it was, you know, this was a massive giveaway and like, you know, everybody is just stealing this money. Like this is like uh, like welfare queens, like just this throwback, the, the the fear tactics of the past. Like everybody, you know, was just stealing this COVID money. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm like, I, I sense Chuck's pessimism about the future. Like I, I am pessimistic too. Um, and that's why I really, you know, I just hope that um, we don't delude ourselves into thinking that we just, you know, that it, it, there are these cyclical times and like America bounces back and somehow we find a way. Um, but like, you know, that, that is not necessarily our destiny. Um, and uh, there, there we can be on the decline of the empire. Um, and we have seen that. I think there's very um, palpable indicators that that is the case. And um, I'm not sure that the ship can be turned around incrementally um, because I think we're just crashing into the iceberg too quickly. Um, I really think that if we don't take our problems seriously and we don't all get together to right the ship, um, that it might be too late. But at the end of the movie, you guys did put in, you know, some more hopeful remarks, especially when you hear, you know, Lassig saying about, you know, Americans, uh, you know, uh, history of, of, you know, of overcoming, you know, so many obstacles. I mean, it, it, it is, you, you do end the film a little bit of a more of a hopeful note. I felt hopeful. <laughs> I, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think that one of the things that, you know, patriots are critics of their own nation. Um, you know, we've gotten to this point that patriotism means a blind obeisance um, to the nation. Patriots are the people who most challenge their nation. Uh, I think that um, Dan and I, uh, we believe strongly in the vision of the founders. Uh, we believe strongly in the American Republic. Um, we believe strongly in uh, and these values. And that's why we wanted to champion Congress. Uh, I mean, really Congress is the cornerstone of our government. Um, and, um, and if Congress fails, um, you know, we, we place far too much stock in the king-like presidents that our founders wanted to avoid. Um, they wanted to empower the people through the Congress. Um, and um, I, you know, I, so this is um, a sign of our deep affection for this country, uh, of our deep affection for our system, and also just a great warning that our system is failing. Uh, and, and all the other great empires crumbled. Uh, and there's no reason why we can't be the next. OK, well, let's see if we can get maybe one last question from the audience. Dan Morgan, you look at a lot of individuals at the center of corruption, but these folk don't seem to see an issue with what they are doing. What is your take? Do they know they're being corrupt? Um, I think what I was saying earlier that I think a lot of these people are good people. I mean, like certainly there's some like very odious evil people in government, but again, I think me and Morgan kind of took the, the view where it's like, you know, there's some disgusting 
very extremely disgusting and possibly illegal things now that Matt, think, Matt Gates has done, uh, just so beyond the pale, like does, that term doesn't even come close. But we figured if he's going to be the first Republican to declare that he's not going to take corporate PAC money, then we should applaud that, despite all of his other flaws. Um, so I don't know. I do think people are trapped inside the system. I, I do think, to you know, what Morgan was saying, that they're very frustrated in that system because you come to Washington like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. You're going to help make the country better. And uh, you get crushed by uh, just the corruption and the paralysis of, uh, you know, a, a system that is, you know, far beyond um, a functioning body. You know, I think every politician, uh, whether it's on the, the state or the city level or the federal level, um, will kind of articulate some sort of um, iteration of like the, the slippery slope. Um, in terms of their involvement in politics, right? It's like, I, by necessity, I have to raise X amount of dollars or else I don't get into my office. And then if I want to keep doing good or I want to keep trying to do good, well, then I need to raise X amount of money. And then, oh, I, there's a handful of things that I have to do that I find to be uh, morally unpleasant or even morally detestable, but that's, that's what the system requires of me. Um, and this is what I'm saying about how I feel like I, you know, this isn't, this isn't a condemnation of all the people who are serving in the Congress. Um, yes, I, there are a lot of despicable people in the Congress, like, don't get me wrong. But there are there are good, well intentioned people, maybe they don't share your worldview. Um, but they're people of integrity who are there to do the right thing by their community. And they are trapped um and they the system if they want to come back the system requires them to make a whole host or if they want to have any authority right so you can be like thomas massey and you can be a complete pariah uh and uh, and then you just can't do anything um uh, which is like it's its own you know its own uh, circle of hell um but like if if you want to be a committee chair um because you're like this is really the committee chairman like if you're just some member of a committee you, you don't really have a lot of say so if you want to have any type of authority and you want to be a committee chair uh, but being a committee chair necessitates that you raise five hundred thousand dollars and the only people who care that you're a committee chair are the people who are invested in the outcome of your committee well by by virtue of that dynamic you are going to have to make insidious compromises and people who you respect and people who you are like you'll see them on congress uh, on tv and be like yeah go get them um if you could only if you spoke to them behind closed doors and they were being candid they are despondent about those dynamics that they're trapped in um and that's why like this is like congress confidential is because like this is these congress these members of congress are actually saying what so many members of congress have said to us they just weren't, weren't willing to say it on camera um and and these are the dynamics at play, uh, and so it's where it's where good people with um, really even virtuous people who hope to do great things for their country, who hope to do great things for their constituents, where their dreams are dashed. Yeah, and you know Thomas Massey makes the kind of metaphor to Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit becoming Gollum. It's a gradual process, I think, too. Like he's not the Hobbit one day and Gollum the next day. But at a certain point, he's so obsessed with the ring, he becomes like a decrepit creature that is just has a one track mind. I think that's a, a pretty good metaphor. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, Chuck, I would, I would uh, be curious to hear your take on that. Yikes. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's, it's hard to generalize of this with, you know, 435 House members and 100 Senate members and uh, not to mention the tens of thousands of staffers that work with these folks. It's very hard for us to make a flat assertion about any element of what we're talking about. It Don't get me wrong. It's an incredibly interesting conversation. But what I'm trying to figure out is how do we, which I think we're all thinking about, is how do we get 
from here to uh, some sunshine and some light and some ideas and some uh, uh, ability to stand across the aisles and talk with each other and actually make decisions. And, and I do believe there are Republicans and Democrats who occasionally, or independents, who, who do want to do something like that. And I'm, I've just been a, a, a pain in the neck investigative reporter type. Uh, I have not been a member of Congress or, you know, but I do believe it could be done. I think it, uh, and maybe it would take a crisis uh, or something where the U.S. is uh, under some great stress uh, globally. I mean, we don't have exactly a lightweight problem right now with uh, another part of the world right now. Uh, and so I do think it, there are possibilities here that it could get better over time. That sounds like Pollyannish, I realize, but I do believe uh, it's going to be needed. If, if this country is going to uh, go south, so to speak, and, and, and not, not do the things we expect them to do as a, as a country, uh, that, that the country could pretty much go to hell or, or close to it. That The challenge for all of us as citizens is to try to find a way that has more clarity and uh, accountability and um, that somehow or other it, it's got to be different than it is now because this could only go south really fast if we're not careful as a people. And, and I do think it's important. Um, I, uh, it's hard to do it all tonight in one hour or however much time we're doing. But I think it's a big deal. It's a huge problem. And it, I do think it's gotten worse uh, with, with the Congress and, and, and the, the government itself. I do think it needs, something needs to go to be better than it is. And uh, I just don't know the answer about how fast that could be, who's going to do it. Uh, but I do think it's a great conversation. And we it does what you have brought on you know to the, to the table here is the issues that you've been tracking and i think it's really important that it could be uh improved upon based on your work and and i i commend you massively i i just hope we can do it uh before the next century I do just want to say one thing that's of just like of a practical nature. I mean, having followed Congress, I mean, if you are so inclined to donate into the system to contribute, I would urge you to not give money to the campaign committees of the respective parties or to the leaderships. Uh, and I would I would uh, recommend that you support a specific candidate because essentially the money that goes into like the DCCC or the DSCC, like that is that is made that money goes straight to maintaining this corrupt system, uh, this this power, this top-down domination by the leadership. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, if you if you want to support a candidate, support that candidate directly, but don't put your money into the engine, which is like which makes sure that this corrupt system stays in place. And I, and I would really urge you to make that to to differentiate that for uh, the people that you know who do take an interest in politics um, because giving money to the leadership is just supporting the status quo in this in this uh, corrupt system because that money is used as the carrot and the stick to keep everybody playing the same corrupt game. No, no, I hear you. I, and I'm not doing the carrot or the stick. I'm just saying that uh, uh, there's some somehow or other there needs to be a clearing here where we can start to as a people, I'm now. I'm, I'm not talking about contributions or money. I just—it just seems like something's got to give, and it's got to get better. And uh, the challenge is, how would that be done? And I—I uh, uh, I do not give, uh, you know, member of Congress contributions. It's not what I do. I, I'm a pain in the neck, investigative reporter type. Uh, but but I do think uh, we do have to be vigilant about what we have here and. It does have to improve. Clearly, what we're looking at as our, as our own country needs help, and somehow it's got to get better. And and you guys have done great work in ex exposing this and laying it out and showing it. And I think that's that's how how things get started. If, if there can actually be a movement where people want to do that uh, beyond uh, 
the Four Musketeers here. Uh, you know, I, I do think uh, there's a lot of possibilities, and I think it's inspiring uh, that we're talking about this. Thank you. We just made the movie of your book, Chuck. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we stand on your shoulders and yeah. some great work that is done uh, before us. We're just doing it in a different form. And I would say uh, support a candidate if you want, but support independent journalism because that seems like the path out of this mess. We need right. to break the media out of the kind of corporate system that maintains the status quo and whose interests are aligned with the funders of the corrupt political system. So, and, 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 hold, and hold your own party accountable. Um, you know, don't let it be this binary choice between good and evil. Uh, certainly neither party is representative of that. Um, you're, you should be advocating for the American people, not for a party. No, I, I agree. That makes sense. Uh, That's a great, great way for us to end. Thank you guys so very much for such an important discussion, especially considered, you know, an election year. Um, you know, it's been a real great honor to have, uh, especially Morgan and Charles being, you know, our very senior advisory board members of the museum. Thank you so much for being here. Then, and always a great pleasure talking to you. And I, I guess we'll, that's the only time that we have for the discussion. And I will hope you'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you. Well, very much like making a film, Disrupt is a very collective effort and has many hands and minds behind it. I would like to thank all the people who have helped us get here today. Bruce Roeder, MPC's founder and president, who from the very beginning has been a huge supporter of this initiative. My team, Clara Huda and Bernardo Cunha for all their collaboration and hard work and for making tonight's event so seamlessly. Uh, to MPC's trustees and advisory board members for all their engagement and support. And thank you all in our audience for being with us tonight for the very first roundtable discussion in our film series. We will be back here in April for an in-depth discussion of Kenyan documentary Softy. And here's sneak peek for you. My father who was in heaven, and my dad got hurt by the police. Please tell him to get a better job. In Jesus' name, we say amen. amen. Kenya has been ranked dismally as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. MP, 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 MP. <laughs> Boniface Mwangi, folks, this young man is one word fearless. I can only imagine how scared I'd be. See my husband taken to the streets. Now he wants to try his hand at politics. What? My heart is made up that I'm going to buy. <laughs> this is how you're telling it. <laughs> Does Boniface Mwangi have uh, deep pockets? No, he doesn't. Is he on the right side of uh, the tribal kingpin? No, he's not. He is going to be a casualty of other forces beyond him. Do not come home. They will kill you. Activist Boniface Mwangi receiving death threats that for the first time target his wife and children as well. It feels like just jumping into a river of crocodiles. I'm sure that's going to be another very, very great conversation. Stay tuned for more information about this event. Until then, take very good care and good night.